nice to be here, even though I'm at the Italian land, it's the very first time that I'm in Italy. So, what are we going to talk? So, many thanks for the sponsors again. They made us a great lunch possible, I think. It was the very best uh, lunch I ever get at the conference. It's really true. It really tastes great. So, uh, some words about, my, about me. I started well, some years ago with C++. It was sometimes before the very first standard came. Okay. Huh? I will try to stand still. And uh, currently I'm working on medical devices, so we we'll make software. <laughs> Uh, no, sorry. I have to change. I, I, tried, I tried this one, even if I don't like it. Um, so today, today uh, the main product, since I'm working already now for 15 years, it's uh, software to display mammography images for radiologists, so for breast cancer detection. And uh, well, even it's now 15 year old code base, I think the co uh, code quality increases from year to year. And besides that, I have some fun projects and activities. And well, I have a great family which supports me to work. So, um, some years ago, a friend of mine uh, made this quote, C++ language is too large for anyone to master. And so everyone lives within the subset. So what you see today and what you hear is my subset. There might be mistakes, please come back to me. Uh, I'm uh, very willing to learn more. So Sean Parent said this at C++ now, some years ago. So, uh, why, are, why am I here? We have probably in our application that uh, we have the goal to display each image regardless of its size, and sometimes our images are really big, in less than one second. So we already started using multi multiple cores uh, many years ago. And uh, I learned during this time it's very easy to make mistakes so that you get phrase conditions or other funny things can happen. And I as well see that it's, sometimes it's getting difficult to maintain this code. So by accident, I listened uh, three years ago to the CPP cast show with Sean Parent where he talked about concurrency, and I really liked it. And I wanted to learn more. So. I asked him if it's possible or if you need a contributor to your library and he was very uh, welcomed me and uh, since then I'm working there I learned really lots no. sorry. Uh, sorry and <laughs> and uh, I care about sharing my knowledge so why are you here so yes Okay, just repeat it. So he read already many things about channels in Go, and that's why right here. Other yeah, squares? Yeah, of course. Okay. So, question is from my side. Um, where is used? Uh, Futures, right? C plus plus future. So stood future. Okay. Whose futures? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm seeing a little bit of hesitation. Uh, who is who, who, who has used already our library, the ST Lab futures? Uh, one has looked into it. ST Lab, Software Technology Lab. So the. No SED, ST Lab futures. Okay. Okay, um, so I'm talking here today about concurrency. Everybody think that he's still or she's still in the right session. 
good. So, why do we have, we have to talk about currency? The free lunch is over. Who said this? Or well, who coined this quote? Well, Herbst, I think. Herbst, I think. It's true. In, it's many years ago. Why is it true? So. Can anybody say why the free lunch is over in regards to this picture? So on the, on the bottom here we have the years. In the top line have the number of uh, microprocessors. Uh, sorry, sorry, the number of uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, units. Yes, sorry, uh, units. So you have ca cores, power consumption, frequency. Why is the free lunch over? You, of course, you can increase the frequencies. No problem. But there's enough energy available. Pardon? You can't reduce latency. Yeah, latency in, inside the CPU is one problem, and there's another problem. Single thread performance is not scaling linearly. We need to go multi thread. So uh, we have CPU to speed up for us. Yes, but the, the question is there's, there's no real limit. You can increase the number of the um, CPU speed, but there's a problem that's not so far. Mentioned, didn't mention it so far. So we, d we have enough energy to bring to the CPU, it's no problem. You can have power supplies which produce 500 watts, kilowatts, no problem. It's an energy density. That's a problem. So you do not, uh, do not get uh, the en energy out of the CPU because it's getting warmer and warmer and you have to get the energy, uh, so the, the thermal energy out of it. And that's a problem. Because already on the die, which is about one square centimeter, it consumes so much energy that you don't have the possibility to get it off it, uh, off, uh, so to, uh, with, um, with in cooling. Of course, you can put the CPU in uh, liquid nitrogen or something like that. But this has other problems. So then we, then so then the C CPU manufacturers started to bring more CPUs on the die at about this. Time here. So we have two cores and then an increase in more. Good. So we still have this Amdahl's law. It's about uh, it tells you the maximum uh, for a executive parallel code that there is a the percentage of the code that cannot uh, be parallelized uh, determines the, the maximum level of uh, the global parallelism. But something like yeah, this. Yeah. Exactly, the speed up. So, this is this formula which we have. So, you have speed up, the number of the percentage of synchronization, and the number of cores. So, if in the ideal world, you have a linear. So to double the number of cores, you have a double, uh, a double of um, speed up. But we don't live in the ideal world. So with just 10% synchronization, we already have this decrease in speed up. Sorry? Okay. So if you have questions or comments, please interrupt me immediately. So, you have 20% synchronization, it goes even worse. So, for instance, you have four cores in 20% synchronization, so you just have 2.5 speed up. You have 90% synchronization, your code works much easier if you go without synchronization, so without multiple cores. Okay. So what can we do, how can we use multiple cores? One thing is, and that's not uncommon, many companies do this. For instance, I know that Facebook did it many years ago. I don't know if, it, if they do it still today, but they did it in the past. They don't have 
in a certain area, multi-thread code, but single-thread code. Um, in case that you have single-thread uh, processes, do you, uh, and you have multiple of them on the machine, you have, so you have two processes in, for, in, in on the assumption that you don't have access to the disk or to the network. Do you have, if you put, for instance, uh, run, run, process, one running process on one core, and then you add a number of cores, do you have a linear speed up? Yes or no? Yes? Yeah. On, the, on the typical, for instance, X, X86 uh, machine. Isn't there some old memory? Yes, so you have already synchronization within your hardware. So at that point, you already lost a bit. Of course, one can use multi threaded process without kind of synchronization. It's probably the same as above. Sometimes you need synchronization between your processes. And then you start, then you need synchronization primitives. Multex, atomics, and all the other fancy stuff. I call them low level, level synchronization primitives. And there exist some high level abstraction of uh, synchronization primitives. For instance, future channels or actors. Small future introduction. Um, small because um, I submit, submitted two talks, one about futures and one about channels. And Marco asked me to uh, talk about channels because the future part is already online on YouTube. So, uh, is anybody who has already seen this one about futures? <coughs> one, okay. <laughs> Okay, um, the future is a mechanism to separate a function from its result. So, you have uh, a function. At some point, it calculates its uh, uh, stuff, and then let, later, magically, the result of the function appears in the future. Yeah, uh, this is no new technique. It was invented about 78, 79. And bought, uh, on this idea, several uh, computer scientists at that time to, uh, came to a similar, similar approach. So sometimes they called them a future, some uh, other called them promises at that time, and they're quite similar. So what can we do? A single future is useless. So it doesn't help really uh, if you want to use multiple cores, because you get a calculation, and then you cannot do anything with a single future. So what you normally do, you have a continuation. So you have a uh, function calculates something, then the result appears, and then it goes into the next function, and then uh, calculation, and then it goes on. And until at the end, some kind of feedback for the user, or you write it on a disk, or submit it to a socket. Sometimes we have something called we when all or when any. So you have two independent futures. They calculate independently, hopefully on different cores. And then at the end, they pass the result to a new future and then uh, uh, to a new function. And then this result uh, creates new one. So this is what. And when all, <coughs> in this case, it um, when both values are ready, it continues. And when any takes, whenever the first one is ready, then it continues. The other one is a split. So you have one calculation, and it, then it uh, goes, when it has the result, it goes uh, parallel to two different fractions. Symmetric, symmetric operation. So um, at this point, um, I have a big section about futures. Um, I skip this now. And these are links uh, to the videos on YouTube where I go into detail for, for the futures. Um, I think Marco later on will 
make slides available, and then you can uh, grab uh, the link as well. Okay, so now we come to channels. Uh, or perhaps just a step backward. A future is great if you have a single operation that you want to, uh, to calculate. So one thing um, expensive to calculate and then you get a result and then you are done. But often you have more than one thing to calculate it on the same way. And in this case, either you make all the things in the same uh, function to ca ca calculate all the uh, things, or you um, create the future again and again and again and again. Because the future is just a single uh, graph of execution, so you can just use it once. Otherwise, if the calculation is done, it's useless, you just can uh, destroy it. You cannot do anything more with it. And it is, at this point, can channel into the game. It's pr pretty much the same. Um, so you can create a graph, so which that allows you to put values from one side into the graph and it calculates them and at the end uh, certain results come off, out of the graph. Um, as well, it's something pretty old, it's from 1978, uh, invented or thought about by Tony Hoare. It's a great book which exists and already it's uh, free online at the end, there are some kind of references that you can look to in it. So, um, you can think of uh, such a channel as, uh, as a pipe. So on one side you can put in uh, certain values and uh, just before it fell out of the pipe, you can add a process to it to do some calculation with this value. Okay. Um, this is now as we implemented channels. We start with one pipe, with the sending part of the pipe, uh, of the channel, which we call sender. Then we, have to then we have to create a receiver, which is the other end of the pipe. And then we tie them together and create a channel. So. Um, inside here is something uh, called um, default executor. That is a machinery which allows you to exec execute tasks. And we have different kind of executors in the library, but in the default executor takes uses the de default thread pool of your machine. So if you are on Windows, it uses the Windows thread pool. On Mac, it uses Grand Central Dispatch. And on uh, Linux, you can uh, <coughs> either uh, integrate uh, the Grand Central Dispatch as well, or uh, you can use a custom uh, developed thread pool which we provide to the library. So whenever you have a task that you want to calculate, you just push it on the, on the thread pool, it calculates and executes what you uh, put on it. Okay, now we have a small task, which is and all these examples in the, on the slide are uh, pretty simple. Um, it just uh, prints uh, a value to the console. Now we pipe the printer to the receiver. So whenever we would put something into the channel, at the end of the channel, it got printed. Okay. At the end, if, because we do not want to attach any, anything more, we have to set this receiver ready, and then we just send three values into the channel, and at the end we got this output. So, of course, this example is really primitive, but it should just sh sh uh, show you how, uh, what you can do with this. Of course, you don't need uh, this kind of machinery to print three values to the console. But it's, I think it's an easy way to do this asynchronously. Okay. 
Okay. Um, sometimes you need have to realize a split. So you may have one calculation and then you want to pass it into two different directions. For instance, one should go on the drive because you want to store certain things and one should to the GUI because you want to update the GUI uh, with a certain result. And in this case, you concatenate uh, the receiver with a pipe operator. Can you code? Now it's a little bit easier, just use uh, C17, the structured bindings. It's the same as before. And we have one printer, printer A, and we, sorry, which we attach to the receiver. And then we do it again on the same receiver. And in this case, it, this is the way as we realize the split. So any, any value which is sent into the channel is then passed into, onto both printer. So onto printer A and printer B. Then again, we send the values into it and we get with this result. Questions so far? The, the question was, shall we process this on the stack? Uh, um, no, because they are copied. So, um, the complete library is uh, value-based, so um, so there's no need to keep a reference at this point. The only reference what you have to keep is this here. I mean that. Yeah, I mean, you mean this one. Uh -huh. So you have to keep this one because this is the resulting uh, um, the, the resulting end of the channel. If you, have, you have to keep this. If you throw it away, the complete channel is gone. So, if you have done this, you can uh, throw away this one here. Because it, with in internal ref counting, it keeps um, the channel uh, alive. If you delete these, then the channel is gone. Another question from you. Okay. Because I put this into the code, I just wait for standard in. Ah, okay. It's just so an, yeah. <laughs> yes. So all these code are, examples are real working. I just uh, transform into the presentation. So uh, I need wanted to have working examples so that they need some kind of this uh, silly thing at the end. Okay. Um, then we, of course we have uh, that we want to merge two channels to a single one. Um, currently we have something which calls join, zip, zip and merge. Um, so um, the names are banned. That's what I learned after I gave, gave a presentation at meeting C++. And um, Ivan Kutsukic I told me that the names are chosen bad because they are different from what we get in the, uh, with the upcoming ranges library. So the names are, will, be, will change to something which is more common to the rest of C++. So, but it means that um, in, in one case we, we continue when we have uh, values from mm -hmm. both. both or from all up, um, upstream senders, and for the other one, whenever we go uh, in a round robin manner, and the other one uh, merges at the moment uh, some kind of unordered. Whenever the next value is ready, we send it downstream. Let's have an example. So we create two channels because we want to merge them. 
And we have one process which accepts two arguments because we want to continue when both are ready. So then we create this, uh, this merge or the, 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 of both, uh, both channels. And at the end, we send certain values into it. And at, at the end, we got this result. Okay, we have a certain amount of options for the channels. So one thing is that you can um, reduce the, the buffer size. So which uh, part of the channel, which values it can um, keep in its uh, back buffer. Because you can start sending values into it and the process is not uh, able of uh, handling them as much, as fast as you send them downstream. So at this point, you can, uh, with the buffer size, you can limit a channel the uh, process to a certain number of, um, of, uh, of values. And you can specify a uh, specific executor. For instance, if you want to update the GUI, uh, most of the UI frameworks that I know don't like to be updated directly from a thread. So you have to update it through the main loop. And for this, you can uh, use an executor which executes its task on in the main loop. I just have a small example. Again, we have two printer. The first one we keep as, as before, and for the second one we use just a different executor. And this immediate executor just as it does, it executes the, the, the process immediately. Okay. Yes. Yeah. No. No. Uh, that's a question that we get that, that we get very often. Um, the sender is not blocked because that means that you uh, need um, additional uh, threads for synchronization, and that's something what we would like to avoid. So at this point. Um, if you have the problem that you might get more values faster uh, from upstream to downstream, then you have to some kind of regulate it. No, uh, no, this will not happen because the buffer size um, is um, the buffer size is for the uh, number of values or the set of values which goes to the next one. So if you have a buffer size of two uh, on, a, uh, on a process, then it just takes two values in its uh, buffer, but it it still will uh, keep going, uh, passing the values downstream. There is no option to add a price and, uh, and uh, add impact pressure on the channel? Not so far. But it's a, it's a great idea, just you are open to some, submit a pull request. Where <laughs> <laughs> so far, we, we implemented the features that we needed. But if, there are, uh, if you want to have different or more features, we are, uh, if it's possible to add them, we are happy to add them. And a pull request is especially very much welcome. Ah, uh, sorry. The question was if there's a try send. So, to see if it's possible to send uh, a value and get an, probably a false, uh, a boolean false back. If, it, for instance, if the buffer was full. That's a nice idea. But so far, we don't have it yet. It is uh, keep uh, base at the buffer inside the channel. Yes. So, is there is an implicit allocator? declared as channel int allocate, standard allocator int, or not? Yes, there's, okay. there's, mm -hmm. if you said it's working on the deck. 
So the buffer is, is realized in a deck. So you have heap allocations, but... Um, and you have customization for a custom deck? Not so far. Okay. But if you want, you can submit a code. <laughs> <laughs> yes? What about the taking process? Um, yes. So the question was, what happens if there are certain problems happen? So a different kind of problems. There might an error might might be happen, or certain things take unexpectedly long. In this case, uh, I wouldn't recommend to use just a lambda or just a callable object as a process, and that's what we want to talk about next. Um, we have something what I call stateful um, process. Um, some problems you have to do need some kind of state. For instance, if you have an end to end relationship, so not for each value which you get upstream, you automatically have one value downstream. Sometimes you have to collect a certain amount of values before you just uh, have to, you can pass something downstream. You cannot do this uh, with a, uh, Lambda. Because Lambda has always one input and one output. Um, sometimes the things get even more complicated. Uh, for instance, when to proceed? What, what happens if from upstream, upstream no more values come? Because something, your sender went dry or whatever happened, or some error happened. So and, and for all these things, you need a different kind of process that you can attach. And for this, you have to implement something which follows this kind of signature. So there's no kind of base class that you have to uh, override uh, and implement. If you know Sean Parent, and there's a famous talk for him, uh, inheritance is the base class of evil. Uh, therefore, you know why there is no base class that you have to implement. So you just have to implement a <coughs> function, a class with the signature. So the first thing is what you have to implement is what you call an await function. Um, this is not a real template, this is just, just an example. So if you have a process which just has one value from up, upstream, then the await function should uh, have, needs one argument. If you have join so that you have two values from upstream, then this function needs two arguments, and so on. Uh, then you have one implement one yield function. So that's the function that actually returns the result from your process. And you have to um, provide a state function so that you uh, can tell the framework how to proceed and when to proceed. So that um, you have to provide, uh, it has to uh, return this process state scheduled. So what it is, how is it defined? So it uh, contains of enum, which says just await or yield, await, so it means I am waiting for new values, I'm waiting for new values, and when the change, um, state changes to yield, that is, ah, I'm ready, now you can uh, proceed and take my results. And this is um, combined with a um, time point, I will come to this a little bit later. Um, optional, you can provide a close function or and an error function, so if the errors uh, or other bad things happen, you can uh, provide this and handle this then in your process if there's something happened. Okay, let's have a exam. Um, so <clears throat> this program implements a small calculating machine. So it, uh, in the end, so you can enter some values and it will uh, <clears throat> When it has enough values, then it just prints the result to it. So, uh, what happens in this adder, so in this process, I will come to it uh, a little bit later. Again, we set up channel, put up, uh, up the adder into it, and then at the end, we want to print uh, the result to the console. So, and then we start, then we just uh, wait for inputs by the user. And if each value that the user provides, we send into the channel. Okay, so look, 
let's have a look at, into the error. Um, of course, we have to sum up the values somehow. So we have to need uh, some uh, place to store the values. And at the very beginning, uh, we wait forever that new values come to the, to the process. Then we have to implement the await. So, of course, we have, because this is an adder, we have to add all the values which, which are brought to us. And for simple reasons, I made uh, the thing, as soon as the user print, type in zero, it will print out the result. So this is the point where it said, no, I'm ready to print out the result. And if it gets zero, then we change the state to yield immediate. And when we yield, the framework asks us, get, get me the result of our process. And we take the result, or we, store, uh, we, uh, we, we remember the sum, we reset the sum to zero, and set our state back to await forever, so that we can do the next calculations, if the user wants. So, and of course we have to return the state. Clear so far? Okay. Um, as we had before, sometimes the things don't happen as you expect. What happens if your user starts sleeping or whatever? It's not typing any more any values. And we want to change it in a way that after 15 seconds of no input, we want to print out the result. So, um, at the beginning, we start with again, await forever. And in our await function, now we have to do change a little bit. That's as we keep this as before, but we change the state, our own, uh, the state which we return to, to the channel. And we say, uh, we are still waiting, but just now plus 15 seconds. So we just keep waiting for the next 15 seconds, and if the 15 seconds expire, then we yield, and then we go on. I think this kind, uh, in this way, to do some kind of timeouts, it's pretty easy, and um, compared, if you do this with callbacks and all this kind of other stuff, the code can be very fast, very messy. You just, you just have to implement single function blocks that you can test, for instance, individually, and then gen, just in, uh, bring them to a bigger graph. Okay, I come to the end. Um, channels close the gap where futures just allow a single execution, single execution. Um, channels allowed that you can execute the things multiple times. And with uh, splits and different kind of uh, joint uh, respective merges, you can build bigger graphs of the complete stuff. Um, take away for you. Use high level abstractions like futures, channels, or others, for instance, other kind of idea of actors to use your course as much as possible. You don't try to implement a thread pool by your own. It's really tough. And there are many examples on the net which are not good. There's a talk by Sean Parent from Coach Dive, I think two years ago, where he dissects a famous or well-published um, thread pool uh, implementation and uh, it shows how bad it's easy to make a, th a thread pool. So use the thread pool if your operating, operating system provides one because you probably cannot do it better. That's for sure. Because they can interact directly into the kernel, which you don't have the possibility to. Um, and design your application in a way that it works even on a single core machine. That's very hard. If you have your multi-threaded code and you want to execute it on the single core machine, that is, it's very hard because it's very easy in this case to create deadlocks. 
but keep this in mind. Because perhaps today you just have two cores, or most of the time you have two cores or four cores, but even on a four core machine, it's easy to create deadlock. And don't let your application be soaked with uh, mutex threads and atomics. It's really hard to uh, read the code, to understand the code, and it's very, very easy, even if you're very experienced in writing multi-thread code, to make mistakes. And sometimes they are very subtle, and they just happen on certain machines, on certain customers, and uh, it's hard to find them, even if you don't have it directly in your debugger. In, especially is this nice if you try to debug this kind of code. Uh, as soon as you attach a debugger to your, uh, to your application, the timing is completely different. So what you're testing is not what's really happening when you are in production. So um, try to avoid it. Use high-level high abstraction. It makes it much, much easier. OK, some acknowledgment. Um, my family let me work on the library. Sean Harris, who taught me really a lot, and I can really recommend his uh, videos and his talks he did uh, over the recent years, and gave me permission to whatever he used in, or he has written or published to use in my um, presentations, and all the other contributors to the SDLab library. Um, some reference. So, the library is complete open source under Boost license and available on, ST, uh, on the STLab libraries. All the documentation and uh, exa example of code is under stlab.cc libraries. And then there are some great books. For instance, this is a book order I already mentioned that is now um, free online available by Tony Hall. We're communicating sequential processes. It's a great book. It, sometimes it's hard to go into it, but it's worth reading. And um, then there was a proposal by uh, Sean Parent, uh, David Sankler, and me for, uh, against the current way as the futures were, or the future extension were proposed, because we thought that it's the wrong way. And uh, especially uh, the new uh, proposal by, led by Bryce uh, Delbach about new futures, or how the futures will be extended. Okay, other great books, other libraries, for instance, the HSpeaks libraries, it's great. And then there's a, uh, another um, channel project, uh, project uh, mm -hmm. available, an actor framework, which is very good as well, and of course, uh, and, uh, Anthony Williams' books <coughs> about concurrency, and more and more. Okay, thanks for talking. Questions? Absolutely, there's no need of synchronization necessary in this case. It's, it's uh, guaranteed that you don't have a race condition. That's guaranteed by the framework. But how is it implemented? Other question? Otherwise, there are lots of examples in the online documentation which you just can take, and all the examples on the website, all of them run and compile. So it's a good starting point to try to make experiments with it. I think you wanted to say. Yeah. Um, there was a, a recent proposal from Herb Sutter to a new way to handle errors. Uh, do you think that uh, it could be interesting to apply that concept uh, to futures and channels? I don't know if you read about this. Yes, I know. Uh, 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 <coughs> I have a great and I was att attended the discussion. Um, 
of course, when they are, uh, and so for the others. Um, the question was how uh, Herb Sutter proposed a new way of uh, exceptions. Uh, so far, we, we have what I think he called the now dynamic exception because some, uh, so the exceptions have been um, transported via the heap. And the new uh, exceptions which he, he and other uh, contrib contributors propose are uh, what he called static uh, exceptions. And so it's a combination of um, using the return channel of a function uh, to, um, to pass to the caller not only the value, but as well some kind of, uh, the exception co uh, an exception code or an error, some kind of error code back to the caller so that he can handle then uh, the, the handle uh, correctly. And the question was, uh, would this, uh, with this proposal, would uh, the futures gain from this? Uh, of course, because at this point, uh, when you use futures or try to do it on multiple cores, you want to gain um, performance, and everything which is, do not have to go via the heap is, of course, is faster. Uh, so I think uh, this will gain. And as I understood the proposal, it should be um, easy to exchange certain things or uh, to mix them as well. That is uh, supported as well. So you can, some part of your code can have, still have the old kind of exception model, uh, your part of your code might change to the new kind, and then this uh, integrates uh, seamlessly to uh, old exceptions uh, as well. So that's as far planned, but this is probably not coming before, before C++ 23. Other questions? This kind of uh, composition of uh, computation uh, is sort of monadic uh, uh, way of uh, composing things? Yes. The question was, is this kind of composition some kind of monadic way of composition? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, more questions? No? Okay. Then, thanks for your attention. And if you have any kind of feedback, I'm really welcome for it. Okay. Thank you.